Today, I upgraded my cooling solution on my CPU. I went from a 240 millimeter AIO or all-in-one liquid cooling solution to a 360 millimeter AIO. And I wanna share all of my findings with you in today's video. Now, before we get into it, let me give you all the backstory. Number one, I don't have any experience with a 360 radiator of any kind. Up to this point, every single PC I've ever built has either had an air cooler on it, a 240 millimeter AIO, or it was a fully custom water cooling loop that only utilized multiple 240 millimeter radiators. I've never used a 360 radiator in any capacity whatsoever. And so the channel has been doing pretty good lately. Thank you so much for the support. I appreciate that. And so I decided to take some of the money and reinvest it back into the channel by buying a 360 AIO and actually doing some hands-on real world testing. Now I did the best I could to make everything an apples to apples comparison as much as I possibly could, but obviously there's going to be some differences here and there. And so this is what we're looking at. So both AIOs are from Corsair. Both AIOs AIOs are part of the elite Capellix family. The main difference between the two AIOs, besides the fact that one's a 240 millimeter and the other one's a 360, is the fact that the 360 Elite Capellix is no longer just the standard Capellix model, it is the Elite Capellix XT. Now, the good news is the only thing that means is that the fans that come in the box are different. That's not actually going to be a factor today because I'm supplying my own fans. I use the Lee and Lee SL Uni fans and I've been using those for quite a while now. I absolutely love those fans. And while I do understand that that doesn't give you an exact test of how the radiator will perform with the exact fans Corsair provides, what it will do is keep all the testing as equal as possible because the entire time I was using my 240 millimeter AIO, every fan in the system was a Lee and Lee SL Uni fan. I figured, let me go ahead and just make all the fans, again, Lee and Lee SL Uni fans so that everything can be apples to apples as much as possible. Now, both AIOs do come with pre-applied thermal paste out of the box. However, I am not a fan of this thermal paste application. So I usually remove the pre-applied thermal paste and I add my own. My go-to thermal paste of choice is Thermal Grizzly Cryo Knot. Now there is technically a very small difference between the two thermal paste applications here. The 240 AIO is using Thermal Grizzly Cryo Knot Extreme, whereas I ran out of Extreme and I was only able to use Thermal Grizzly Cryo Knot Ultra for the 360 AIO. While I don't necessarily think this overly impacted the overall testing results, I did want to provide you that information for full transparency. Now, as with all of my videos, I do provide chapters, AKA timestamps down below. So if there is something in this video you are not interested in, feel free to skip ahead and check out the section you are the most interested in. And now with that being said, all of the test results you are about to see, you could have seen early if you were a Patreon member. All of the testing here was uploaded early and individually on my Patreon page. And so thank you to all of my current Patreon supporters. If you wanna join the team, I'll have a link in the pinned comment below this video. And now for the rest of the video, we're going to talk about the testing conditions, the testing results, and then my final thoughts and conclusions on a 360 AIO versus a 240 millimeter AIO. But first, a quick word from today's video sponsor. Are you like me and you bought a cheap generic gamer chair from Amazon and now you're regretting it because it feels like crap, it looks like crap, and it fell apart on you? Well, hey, I got the solution for you. Introducing the Sihu Doro C300 Ergonomic office chair. The average person sits 2,336 hours per year. So if you are going to be sitting down for that amount of time, you want to make sure you're properly supporting your body. And the Sihu Duro C300 has dynamically self-adaptive lumbar and back support. You can feel the difference. I have played video games in the chair. I have edited videos in the chair. I have sat back, put my feet up on my desk, and just enjoyed watching TV, and it all felt amazing. This is a high-quality product. It is a premium product all the way around. The chair offers multiple different sitting positions. You can kick back and lock it in place. You can raise it up and down. The armrests go up and down. The armrests turn in and out. And the neck rest can be adjusted in multiple different kinds of ways as well. You can also raise and lower the back of the chair. Like I said, this is a high quality premium product and I have two links down below. If you prefer Amazon, there's a link there. Or if you want to take advantage of my discount code, check out the Sihu website for 6 
20% off using my special discount code. I'm telling you, if you have a gaming chair, you're not doing your body any favors. You need to get an ergonomic office chair. So check out the links down below. And now it's time for all the technical details about the testing conditions. So first of all, as I said, I'm using Lee and Lee SL Uni fans, and I decided to use the standard fan curve for the Lee and Lee fans. And I will have a picture on the screen showing you exactly what that looks like. Now, as for the AIO pump speed in IQ, you can set the speed based on presets from quiet to balance to extreme. Now, unfortunately, you can't go into IQ and say, hey, make my pump speed 100% all the time. I looked into it quite extensively. I'm not the only person with this problem. Many other people have gone to Reddit looking for the same solution. And unfortunately, all you can do is use one of the predefined pump sets inside of IQ. If I'm wrong and you know a better solution, let me know in the comment section below. But for an apples to apples comparison, what I decided to do was run the 240 millimeter AIO and the 360 millimeter AIO both on the balance preset. Now, unfortunately, after I did all the testing with the 240 and the 360, both on the balance preset, I was a little bit disappointed with some of the numbers I was seeing. And I had a friend suggest, why don't you go back and test everything with the extreme preset? And unfortunately, at that point in time, it was way too late to go back and put the 240 millimeter AIO back into my main system and use the extreme preset. However, I was still able to test the 360 millimeter AIO on the extreme preset. And while we don't have the numbers for the 240 millimeter AIO on the extreme preset, I do believe if you look at the balance preset for the 240 and the 360 AIO, and you look at the difference between the two, I do believe that would scale proportionally on the 240 millimeter AIO if you were to use it on the extreme preset. And so I do still think there is some value here based on the numbers you are about to see. And now without any further ado, let's get into all all of the temperature testing. So number one, I am in a controlled environment with controlled temperatures. And so my ambient temperature was 72 degrees Fahrenheit or 22 degrees Celsius. My idle temperatures on the 240 millimeter AIO was 44 C for the CPU and 34 C for the GPU. My idle temperatures on the 360 millimeter AIO for the CPU temperature was 41 C. And again, on the GPU temperature, 34 C. I also ran Cinebench R23, both the single core and the multi-core test. Now on the multi-core, test, this will put your CPU under 100% load. And so here are those test results. Now for the multi-core test on the 240 millimeter AIO, the max CPU temperature was 85.3 C. And on the single core test for the 240 millimeter AIO, the max CPU temperature was 58.9 C. Now sticking with the multi-core test for the 360 millimeter AIO, the max CPU temperature was 83 C. And for the single core test, the max CPU temperature was 55.4 C. And now you're looking at the final final testing results for both the 360 millimeter AIO and the 240 millimeter AIO in regards to Cinebench R23 with the multi-core scores and the single core scores. And so now, as you can see with all the temperatures here from idle to the multi-core stress test, you can see that the 360 AIO is only lowering the temperatures about two to three C on average. Now, don't get me wrong, that is still a lower temperature and you definitely wanna see those numbers going down and not up. And that is definitely a good thing overall, but you do have to ask yourself the question when you're starting to compare pricing here on a 240 versus a 360 AIO is two to three C really worth it in the grand scheme of things. But now the big question is, how does all of this relate to gaming? Because after all, you're not gonna go buy a 360 AIO and go home and run Cinebench all day long, right? You're gonna play video games. And so now let's talk about some of those games. So I ran Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, I ran God of War 2018, and of course I ran Cyberpunk 2077. I maxed out everything on native 4K, ray tracing where applicable, and I really was trying to stress test the system. I really was. I, I put as much power into the system as I could because I wanted to see how hot things could get under load. And so here are my results. Okay, starting things off with Cyberpunk 2077, native 4K, no upscaling with ray tracing turned on, and we are using the in-games ultra preset. I'm also recording this with OBS, which will also lower frame rates and increase temperatures. So FYI on that. If you're looking at the temperatures, you can see where the 360 millimeter AIO, depending on the scene and the benchmark, is coming out ahead of the 240 millimeter AIO. However, you have to give it to the 240 millimeter AIO here because it is hanging in there with the best of the best on the 360 millimeter AIO, and it is definitely trading blows. You gotta give credit where credit is due. I'm not gonna call this a clear win for the 360 here because the temperatures are so close, it is really hard to argue a clear winner. And even if you could say the 360 millimeter AIO is the clear winner, you have to really evaluate the price point and say, is it actually worth the extra cost given the temperatures you're looking at? But now we're moving over to Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 2022 
on the ultra preset native 4k again no upscaling of any kind i ran the end game benchmark here and as you can see again it's a very similar story to cyberpunk 2077 the 360 millimeter aio edges out the 240 ever so slightly but the 240 millimeter aio is definitely hanging in there with the 360 millimeter aio now for my final game i have god of war 2018 native 4k no upscaling of any kind on the ultra plus preset and as you can see here this is where we definitely have a clear winner with a 360 millimeter aio the balance preset is ahead of the 240 millimeter and the extreme preset is in a clear first place here occasionally the balance preset 360 aio is matching the extreme for the most part across the board you have three two one from left to right so god of war 2018 is definitely showing where a 360 millimeter aio is superior to a 240 millimeter aio now i'm really looking forward to the comment section because I'm sure I'm going to get the comments that say, hey, everybody knows a 360 millimeter AIO isn't really that much better than a 240. We could have told you that. You wasted your money. Or the majority of people are probably going to find something to nitpick with a testing setup and say, hey, you should have tested 1080p instead of 4K, or you should have tested more games, or your thermal pace isn't exactly the same, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality of the situation is this. I did a lot more in this testing scenario than the average gamer is going to do. The average gamer is just gonna sit there and assume that a 360 is definitely better all the time and they're gonna buy it because it's the best. They're not gonna go home and run all the side-by-side -side benchmarks. In fact, running these benchmarks individually, I wasn't really able to pinpoint exactly what the differences were. It wasn't until I put everything in my editing software chopped it up and put it side by side that I was really able to see exactly what we were looking at. And if you go back and you look at the testing results, you'll see that in God of War, there is a clear winner. In God of War, a 360 millimeter AIO is definitely better than a 240 millimeter AIO. But in Cyberpunk 2077, in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, yeah, the 360 edged out the 240 in some scenes of the benchmark, but it was not a night and day difference. The, the difference actually was incredibly small. It was very minimal. In fact, I would make the argument the extra cost for a 360 over a 240 was definitely not worth it. The other thing you have to keep in mind here is I'm running the 7800X 3D and there's two things I want to point out about that chip. Number one, it's a hot chip. It is. Ryzen runs hot anyway and then especially the 3D chips run hot. It is a hot chip. Now with all of that being said, the idea behind Ryzen CPUs is the colder you make them, the higher they will boost. But if you saw in every one of these testing conditions, my CPU never went past 5,050 megahertz. And that's because my CPU specifically, at least with my motherboard setup and all of that stuff, cannot clock any higher than 5,050 megahertz. That is the absolute maximum that my 7800X 3D will hit. And so even in cases like God of War, where I was able to get noticeably lower temperatures when compared to the 240 millimeter AIO, it did not yield me any additional clock speeds, any additional boost performance, or any additional performance in general in terms of even frame rate. And you can see that looking at the test results. And so you can really make the argument, I gained nothing giving my CPU configuration. Maybe if you had a 7900X, or maybe if you had a 7950X, or maybe if you had a 13900K or something like that, then maybe you would see more of a difference and then you would actually gain more of a benefit in terms of your overall gaming performance because your temperatures would be lower. Maybe. I don't have those chips. I don't have the privilege of testing that to share with you that information. But what I would say here is overall, I think an argument can be made that you, you will be fine in most situations if you want to save the money and go with a 240 millimeter AIO or a really high end air cooler, or you can even split the difference and maybe go with a 280 millimeter AIO and still save the money when compared to a 360 millimeter AIO and you'll be totally fine. The other thing I want to point out here is that really pay attention to the CPU that you're using, okay? Because if you're using something like a 7800X 3D and you know that the maximum boost clock is gonna be around five gigahertz, give or take, and you're already hitting that with your current configuration, you're not going to net anything by going and buying a better cooler. 
Now, if you're looking to get off your current CPU and go with something that you know runs hotter, like a 13900K, for example, then it might be worth the investment. But again, it's hard for me to say that because I haven't actually been able to test that. And I'm sure some of you have. So definitely let me know in the comment section below. Hey, if you watched all of this video, thank you so much for the support. I really do appreciate it. If you're new to the channel, consider becoming a subscriber. I would appreciate it. I look forward to talking to you down in the comment section below. Hit that like button because it goes a long way in helping me out. And until next time, E-Rock out.